Wow, that's so official. This meeting is being recorded. Hi, everybody. My name is Terry, and I'm with the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. And I have the honor today of bringing you Mark Heher. So um, I could post it in the chat again to panelists and attendees. That here is the link to Mark's blog if you want to follow him. Um, I affectionately say I'm cyber stalking him all the time because he has all these interesting adventures. <laughs> and Mark is actually a, a, an author, so he's written two books now. And uh, perhaps later on we'll do another session where you can you can come and share your second book all about your your time when you went hitchhiking and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, is so brave. I would be too scared to do that. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so we can, we can talk about that more in the future and things like that. So what today's presentation is about is the Eulestack natural area. So a couple days ago, um, Mark and I went to Eulestack and that's over in Santa Clara. And we went to um, check out the Eulestack natural area and see what it's like and see if it's accessible and just kind of to have an experience there and see, see, you know, what we could experience. And so I got to go with Mark and his sister and we checked it out. So this presentation is all about his experience. Um, what we're going to do now is that I, I am physically Mark's voice. <laughs> These are his thoughts, and then I, I'll throw my thoughts in too, but I'll tell you when it's mine, or you'll know because there'll be like a little jabbering that goes on, and that's me. <laughs> Mark has very collected thoughts, and if you have any questions for him, please do feel free to put those in the chat, and then Mark, if you open up the chat on your, if you, I believe you already have it open on your screen, once I start to share my screen for the PowerPoint, I can't see the chat anymore. So um, you'll need to go ahead and answer people's questions as they're asking you and things like that. Um, and so, yes, so if you have questions for Mark, he's here live and he'll respond live in the chat. Um, and so we will go ahead and get started with our adventure. Oh, forgot to share. Share the screen. So the Eulestack Natural Area, these are my thoughts. The Eulestack Natural Area is a really interesting little park over in Santa Clara. It's off of Montague Expressway and Lick Mill Boulevard. Um, and if you're in that park, you can actually see the Levi Stadium. It's kind of really close to there. So if you're gonna go explore, um, once football season starts, you need to watch the schedule for that because during events, they do shut the parking that's on the street. So if you have a, a chair and, and you have an accessible vehicle, then you can park across the street in Lick Mill Park. And um, they have a, um, a parking spot there and that's a little bit safer. And, um, but if you have a, a typical car and you're going, just be aware that sometimes they shut that road down um, if, if they're going to be having events because they wanna be able to charge for parking and it's close enough that people can walk. So they're trying to deter that a little bit. So well, the first time that, that I went to Eulestack, I was told by my supervisor to drive out there and check it out because while the Open Space Authority does not own Eulestack, it's owned by the city of Santa Clara, it's actually a location that we helped to fund. So we, we uh, granted them a good amount of money to like help create the park and turn it into a natural setting like this and to help create the pathways and the interpretive panels and paid for things like irrigation and plants and things like that. And then once we do that, then it's kind of like hands off. So Open Space Authority doesn't um, continue to maintain properties once the project is complete but we are allowed to go do programs there like this. So that's why I was able to go out with Mark. I have to move this little toolbar. It was like right over the stuff. The Ulestack Nature Preserve is a beautiful nature area to enjoy and explore. It's just minutes into my hike. I forgot I was in the middle of a city 
but rather in a natural setting in the countryside. I enjoyed looking at different ecosystems such as woodlands, grasslands, wetlands, and a native plant and native plant habitats. Listening to the many birds in the preserve was a delight as birds bird watching is one of my hobbies. Some trails are in the shade, making it a pleasant hike during the summer months. The preserve is very accessible and I look forward to future visits, especially this coming fall. So the picture that we're looking at right now has two low split rail fences on either side of it and it's a it's peeking into the butterfly garden that is there at the Eulistac natural area and so you can see some dry bushes that are starting to get their leaves back and you can see other larger bushes and the butterfly garden just so you know is actually about maybe close to 10 years old now and um, has been available for people to go see. The Eulistack Natural Area is located at 4901 Lake Mill Boulevard in Santa Clara. And when you drive up, the parking is actually on the street. So um, there is one parking space that kind of goes in. And I used to think that was for ADA parking, but I realized it doesn't work um, unless your ramp could actually go onto the curb. So I, I don't think it actually works, though, for, for um, um, disabled access. So this is the entrance. You can see that there's a sign here that talks about the rules, that this is a natural area and the plants and the wildlife are protected by law. So even though the, the entrance is wide enough for a chair, they don't want people to be using motor vehicles that are like motorcycles and recreational motorized vehicles and things like that. But you can use motorized vehicles if it's part of your accessibility. So you can do that. Dogs are allowed at this park. So if you wanna bring your dog, you can do that. They just have to stay on leash and you need to clean up after them if they go to the bathroom because that can actually scare na na native animals if they smell a predator scent, even if it's a little chewy. <laughs> So this is a high risk area for fire because it has so many natural plant native plants that go dormant and that are a little bit more chaparral. Um, so because of that, it does have a high fire risk. So it's probably not a good idea to be smoking in here. And the other thing is that the water that's used in here is recycled. So if you see water coming from a hose or something in there, it's, it's not a good idea to drink it. I, not that people do that anymore. <laughs> But it, it's not a good idea. So those are my thoughts. This is one of several paths that you can explore. This picture shows the dry sagebrush like on the on the right hand side and it has some large plants that are starting to grow over the trail on the right hand side. On the left hand side, it's a little bit more open. You can see some flowering shrubs and some dry grass. I like to look for birds, lizards, and other animals during my hikes. Hey, Mark, is this your GoPro? <laughs> That's really cool, man. Oops. Sorry, I pushed it again. The diversity of trees at Eulis Tack is amazing. So um, for my, for this is me speaking now that, that um, when you go there, you can see all different kinds of trees. And 
um, I was waiting to see what Mark would do with this because there's so many birds and the birds love these trees. But also you can see that there are some eucalyptus trees and I believe that the plan is to take those trees out when it's safe for the birds to do so, but they can't remove them until they have other trees that grow up tall enough to be habitat for those birds that are using them right now. Mark, I'd be interested to know like which kind of tree did you see that was like your favorite? Like if like that you were the most impressed by when we were there, if you wanna put that in the chat, that would be awesome. And then for, for those of you who are watching on the right hand side of this picture, you can see there's a um, there's a rise over here. So that's actually a berm on the right hand side that actually um, would keep the Guadalupe, Guadalupe River from flooding the area. So the water comes from from the south towards the north towards the bay and all along the Guadalupe River you have these huge dirt like um, supports to like help filter the water that direction. So it's actually quite a big a big river down there. You could see all these trees here. Some of them are dead. So like the dead ones are actually left for habitat. So they could have woodpeckers and things. Like when we were out there, I could hear woodpeckers. They're probably acorn woodpeckers, but I could hear them out there. I know that it seems like, like to, to some people this would look like weeds, but it's actually a lot of native plants that have gone dormant. And they do have some struggle with, with uh, non-native invasive plants too, but they're doing a really good job with their volunteers and with the staff um, to try, you know, to keep this property like um, really beautiful and, and as a good habitat. All the trails were wide enough for my electric wheelchair. So while we were out there, I was kind of nervous because I was like, oh no, is this going to work? Oh no, is that going to work? And I would no sooner have that thought than Mark was like, choo. <laughs> I'm like, where'd he go? Oh, he fits. <laughs> so he's the best for going and checking out a park with. I was like, this is so cool. And, and so, you know, he went into the butterfly habitat and then down these pathways like this too. And, and they've been doing a good job of like keeping them wide enough for wheelchairs. So I think it's a good spot if you want to go check it out. Oops. You can see the interpretive panels up there on the top um, and that there's, there's pathways like this. Oops, let's try to, oh, there we go. Hey Mark, so like when you go up trails like that, I was wondering, does that, um, is that like harder on the battery for your chair? This is all looks like decomposed granite. So it seemed like a pretty good surface. Did you find that it was a comfortable surface for you? Elm trees, loves elm trees. Oh, okay. One of the first videos that I ever saw of, of Mark was him. I heard this, woohoo! And I thought it was him saying that. I realized later it was your sister probably. <laughs> but you took like a, a running start and went up a really steep hill. And I didn't know that chairs could do that. And I was like, oh my gosh, this guy's crazy. He was like so adventurous too. So, um, so that's good to know that if it is steep, that it can drain the battery faster. But he says this one wasn't too high. So that's good. <laughs> it was kind of warm that day too. Not too bad. So Ron Horry's point, oh, I did open the chat in the side, by the way. So um, Ron Horry's pointing out that it's about 40 acres. And um, as I was driving in 
from Montague and I took Lick Mill and I was driving in, I was getting really nervous the first time I ever went out there because there's all of these huge apartments and it's kind of like driving into a Lego village, you know, it's like really tall. And, and then I saw this tiny little neighborhood park and I was like, is that it? Oh no, it's like on a barbecue. <laughs> and then I kept going and then all of a sudden it opened up and I could see the, the natural area. So that was really nice. So Mark says that there are interpretive signs posted throughout Eula Stack. These right here talk, I believe, about the, the butterfly garden that's just in front of it. And the entrance to this would be just to the left. Oh yeah, so this is an interesting spot too, because um, as you go to the right, you can actually go to a little area where classes can sit. Um, but I prefer one that would be behind you. Um, that's a bunch of logs. One of the logs, so this is actually one of the logs for hikers to sit on and relax. These um, sage bushes on the right hand side are like really fragrant. So they're fun if you want, if you don't mind being a little sticky, you can go touch them and they smell great. Oh, this is going into the shady spot, huh? So in the back of the preserve, they actually have quite a few eucalyptus trees and it's a really shady, cool spot. So if you want to go, if it's like really hot, like today, <laughs> <laughs> or yesterday and you're like I just want to go outside someplace that's still cool you can actually go back there and you can actually experience that that even in the summertime it's actually very pleasant there were times in the past when we used to do like summer camp like with kids and have like a little short summer camp session and we would hide out in there because it was nice and cool Look at all the different colors. That's interesting. They have all these trees in the background and the leaves are doing different um, parts of their, their life cycle and, and the grass is there. Oh, so this section that's in the front here, because it's so flat like that, um, it's actually flat because there's a huge pipeline that goes underneath it that moves water. So that's part of the water that comes from Hetch Hetchy. And so if you were to stand up on top of the um, causeway and, and look um, to, to the left of the screen, this entire swath all the way across the street, there's only parks or open areas on top of it, no structures. And that's because the pipelines underneath the ground, it's actually big enough that you could stand up and walk in it. That's how huge it is. And every now and then they have to send somebody in to check and make sure it's not leaking. And so they have to close the water off in certain sections. It's kind of crazy to think about, but, um, but that is underneath. Hey, Mark, one of the things I was wondering about with this is like if we did a plant walk and there were some like really cool plants out on the sides of this, would would you be able to like go out there or would the average folks in chairs be able to go out there to look at it or would it be or do we need to like stay like right on the trail? Just so the rest of you know, 
Mark and I are in cahoots for how to do programs together. <laughs> so we're coming up with adventures. So it helps to have a wide area to turn around. Okay, that's good. So let's talk about the many plants that Eula stack. Um, one of the apps that you can use is Seek, S-E-E-K, and um, that's a free one and it's from the um, iNaturalist. It's kind of like iNaturalist for kids. <laughs> if you're like me, have a short attention span, you can use that one. And so if you're going through this park and you wanna like look at different plants and you're not sure what they are, you can use that app to actually get an idea of what those plants could be. Oops, yeah. Does anybody know what this one is? Da, da, da. I should hum Jeopardy. Woohoo! Ron thinks it's a California wild rose. Does anybody else agree? <laughs> You're actually right, Ron. So this is what a rose looks like when it's in its natural native state, not bred to be big and showy, but just doing what it does naturally. These roses actually smell really good. And, and this is a native California rose. So um, when it's all done with the flower, it'll make a bright red bulb. And that's actually a rose hip. And it's something that, that you can use. You can have like rose hip tea if you want to try that. It's really sour because it has vitamin C in it. So if you were living out here like two, 300 years ago and you needed to get vitamin C into your system, you could either have Douglas fir pine needles like those or Douglas fir needles that you could make a tea out of. Um, or this one is actually better, I believe, to use California um, native rose hips for that. But if you try to bite them, they are really intense. <laughs> so, look, I don't recommend eating things you find in the park. It is protected, but um, but yeah. Ooh. So I actually looked this one up on the Seek app, which is kind of funny because I will try it right now. Ooh, there's like Seek, like this. Because, you know, I was like, oh, now I forgot. I think I remember. And and so the C-cap has like a little, oops. <laughs> it has a thing on here that's a little picture of a camera. So you hold it up to what you want to take a picture of. And you just hold it up to the screen. Or not the screen, the actual plan. I'm cheating. Okay. And this says that it believes that the species is island mallow. Cause I saw this and I was like, what is that a hibiscus? Cause like the little thingy sticking out, but it's actually, I guess, so they think it's an island mallow. If there's any plant aficionados in there that know, know better, let me know. <laughs> ah, island mallow from the channel islands. Ron, did you actually use the app too? Or did you already know that? It's okay, it's okay. That's what these apps are for. Oh, these are interesting because these are the um, California buckeye tree. And when it's in full bloom, these blossoms look like a banana covered in popcorn. They're like really big like that. And they smell wonderful. But this tree is unusual in that it is summer deciduous. That's a good Jeopardy question, huh? So uh, what that means is that in the summertime, when it gets hot, this tree protects itself from drying out by dropping all its leaves. So you know how like in the wintertime, other plants will drop their leaves and kind of go to sleep. This one does it in the summertime to avoid drying out, but it's actually really beautiful and awake all during the colder seasons of the year. Um, but yeah, and then it has like a, a buckeye on it. It has like the, a really large, fruit that's like a nut and it has this felt on top of it so it looks like deer skin and when it starts to dry out it'll go like that and it looks like a deer's eye so that's why this this tree is called a buckeye 
you could eat the buckeye nuts if you were desperate but you have to cook them in the ground like like a luau style and and it has to cook for like tons of hours like really long time like 12 hours and then you have to eat it within like two hours of it being done or it goes bad pretty quick so it's i don't recommend it it's not very tasty but if you were desperate you could do that and you could survive oh and then ron was pointing out that butterflies and native bees love this plant um but it, but it is toxic oh it's toxic to european honeybees oh <gasps> oh that's good to know Mark, when you were out there, did you get a chance to smell this one? <laughs> You're not like me. I go up and smell things all the time. <laughs> oh, you did. You did smell it. Did you sneeze? <laughs> oh, I like this one. This is, I call this the Ghostbuster plant. So this is California sage. Um, this is our native sagebrush and it smells wonderful when it's green like this and in the old days people used to use this to clear spiritually clear a site so if you make a bundle of it and you burn it while it's green it smokes a lot and so you'll see people on television doing this and they have feathers um, or a fan and they're wafting the smoke like this and so when people would go and they would pick a spot where they were gonna build their home, they would walk all around it with this and it would spiritually clear out any negative energy or negative spirits or things like that. Ron calls it cowboy cologne. That's true, you can rub it on you. <laughs> it's better than Old Spice. But, um, but yeah, and, and the thing is that we used to think, oh, you know, that's just tradition and blah, blah, blah. But it turns out that some scientists did some research and they did an experiment and they found out that the smoke from California sage actually does kill bacteria. So it was killing some of the airborne um, bacteria that could cause colds and things like that. So there's something to it, right? Because they were able to do that. Oh. Do you guys know what this one is? <laughs> if we go out here, I'm going to try to get my friend Richard from Saved by Nature to make us some jam. Oops. These elderberry bushes are beginning to have their berries. And so the Native Americans, as soon as these things started to have berries, they would stop trading for shellfish on the coast. That's because you can't see that the coast has red tide. There were pretty extensive trading systems all through this area. Um, some of the artifacts that have been found have been shells from the coast. Sometimes they get, you know, anywhere, like we don't have volcanoes here, so we wouldn't have like things like obsidian and stuff like that. We would be using, would have been using chert to make um, arrowheads and things like that. So whenever you find flakes of things like that, it's because it was traded. And this will turn into beautiful um, purplish blue, like little bitty berries. And they're actually kind of bland. They're not that exciting to eat, but people will make like elderberry wine or elderberry tea. And it turns out that elderberry bush actually has um, properties in it that will help fight colds. So it's from the Sambucus family. So if you um, start to get a cold and you want a natural remedy, you can go to Whole Foods and you can actually get elderberry tea and it'll help you with that. But the thing is, like I was saying, over on the coast, once it gets hot, you start to have die off of different animals, like in the water, little tiny creatures. And, and it starts to make a toxic situation. So you can go to the beach sometimes in late summer and you can see that the tide, when it falls, the waves fall, it actually looks red or pink. And the state park system will put advisories in effect when that happens, because while it may not hurt you, it's definitely unsafe to eat shellfish that have ingested that red stuff. So these, these guys somehow figured out that okay, you know, when we trade for shellfish while the elderberry is actually here, it's causing people to get really sick and die. So they just, just, they learned from that pattern not to trade at that time. I'm always curious as to how people figure stuff out like that. 
Hey, who knows what this is? <laughs> Give you a hint. Somebody who pollinates it needs a really long beak. California fuchsia. You're right. You're right. So when I go here with Mark, he's used to me like running around smelling things <laughs> and checking stuff out, getting all excited. Ooh, the shady spot. This is also the best spot. This is in the back. This is the best spot for finding the most birds. They're all over in there. Oops. You can see like um, a lot of the bark has fallen off of the eucalyptus trees and eucalyptus trees have a chemical in them that will actually inhibit the growth of other plants. So like if you look at the bottom of these trees, there's not a lot of shrubs and things. And that's an, that's an evolutionary adaptation that that tree has to try to stop competition for the same soil. It's the only forest in Santa Clara? Oh yeah, you might be right. <gasps> oh, there's the, there's the pathway again that goes up and over um, to like see the, the, the river. I'm looking forward to coming back to the Eulestack natural area in the fall and next spring to see the changes of the foliage and wildflowers. Mark, I think it's going to be amazing to go out there. Um, like, I'd probably like be stalking you and go out again. <laughs> this this park has a lot of beautiful wildflowers in spring. It's really nice, and it's very cool and breezy in the fall. So, does anybody have any questions for Mark that they would like to ask? Please feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat. And then Mark, if you have anything you'd like to add, please feel free to do so also. So Ron would like to know, how do you like the Guadalupe River Trail? And Mark says, I like it, but it gets dusty, which isn't good for my ventilator. That's really good to know. Also on top of that um, trail, it's, it's kind of really gravelly. Oh, the east side is big. Ta-da, me with my fun mask. <laughs> A fan picture, woo! Thank you so much for watching everybody. And, and thank you, Mark. Um, what do you think your next um, destination will be in Santa Clara County? So like if somebody wanted to join you um, for an exploration of a park, like one, like where would you, how would you like them to get a hold of you? And then which one do you think you'll check out next? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> Ooh, the Coyote Creek Trail. Is that your favorite? Neat. Right on. Okay, so one thing that we could do is if you want to get a hold of Mark, um, you can you can email me and I will put my um, information here. <laughs> it's such a long email. Open Space Authority. Org, and you can email me and let me know and then I can give him your contact information and then he can contact you if you'd like to go together someplace to like check something out no pressure no pressure 
but um, we will be doing some more hikes in the future. And what we're looking forward to doing is actually going out and having people join us on some of these, some of these hikes so we can go together and figure it out. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you, Ron, for all your help too. And uh, take care everybody. And, and, and uh, Ron, Mark is saying thank you for your comments too. Stay cool out there, everybody. It's another hot day. And, and uh, if you have any ideas for future programs or locations that you'd like us to go to um, and take you with us, let us know. Go ahead and email me at, at that email and let me know your ideas. We're very much interested in doing the things that you're interested in experiencing. Thanks you everybody, thank you.